Okay, we should be live. I'm glad. Here we are, guys. Welcome back to the Sunday stream. It is just me this time. I've got no guests, so you'll just have to listen to my wonderful voice for the next hour and some change. I do have an excellent presentation set up for all of you guys, so as soon as everyone uh, comes on in, and we'll get started shortly, and let me go tweet out that we're live real quick. Go put that out there. And there we go. All right. Can't wait to post late and gay in 30 seconds. <laughs> I think that's like the chat's obligation is that any time that there's just the slightest delay due to broadcasting or stream yards or whatever, you have to say that I'm late and gay. I think it comes with the tradition of everyone from school. Just, you know, if the teacher's not here, you've got 15 minutes before you're legally obligated to leave. And you've got 30 seconds before you can post late and gay for a live stream. But no, uh, I'm not late. I'm usually pretty punctual with these things. The only times I'm ever usually late is usually when I have guests on. But anyways, guys, how is everyone doing this fine Sunday? I figured I'd chat with you all for a little bit before we get started, just so we let everyone roll on in, and um, then we'll get into the presentation. It's been a pretty good week so far. My uh, my weekend was made yesterday when we crossed 2,000 subscribers, so I'm incredibly happy about that. We've only been doing this since the end of October, and I'm incredibly happy about that. So, uh, yeah, we've made it to 2,000, and I think that that is definitely something worth celebrating for. So with that being said, I wanted to thank all of you guys up front and in advance for just subscribing and listening and you know, interacting with me and getting me to talk to other people. I mean, since this has all started, you know, getting to know people like Aaron or Don the Pleb or even being on Academic Agents channel for two appearances now, I feel incredibly lucky and incredibly blessed. Because, you know, I got asked in a DM not too long ago uh, sort of what the question was about, like, well, why are you doing this? And, you know, I when I had started, of course, this was in October of last year, I had been dealing with the... Uh, kidney stuff for only a couple of months at that point. And it just sort of brought dawn on me, you know, for the longest time in my circle of friends or colleagues or whatever, people would always ask me for what my opinion was because I was the only sort of uh, right of center opinion amongst, you know, college colleagues or people I worked with. Um, and so I thought, you know, why not give it a shot, especially after years of consuming content? Why not actually get off your duff and make something? So I'm pretty happy with what I've made so far. I know that we can only go up from here and, uh, I'm incredibly happy about that. So with all that being said, thank you all so very much. Um, and with that being said, I do have a fun presentation for you all today. Um, and in fact, it's about one of the guys that inspired my love and passion for international relations and uh, geopolitical analysis, uh, none other than that of Dr. George Friedman. Um, I originally heard of Dr. George Friedman back in high school. I read his book, The Next 100 Years, which came out um, a little over 10 years ago now, um, call, in 2009. And it was sort of just this, you know, understanding of what the world was supposed to look like. And he sort of predicted out based on trends and history and geography of, you know, where conflict might happen, how power is distributed on a national stage, how the international order happens. So um, it, he inspired me to just understand the word geopolitics. And I was just in love with that sort of stuff. So that, that's how... Throughout high school and college, I became obsessed with just, you know, understanding how countries are interacted with one another, how the power structure worked and how, you know, institutional power on a global scale gets applied when we take a look at things such as the national interest. Um, so we're, we'll be talking about him today as well as his book. Um, the content drought is real, so thank you. Oh, anytime, Shrouded Hills. I like the fact that we do a weekly show. I think it... Um, gives you all something to look forward to. And for those of us who work, right, like Sunday is always that sort of like dreading day. We're like, yeah, you know, like Monday's tomorrow. I have to go back to the office or whatever. So I, I want to at least give your weekend a conclusion on something of a good note, usually a good presentation. And then, of course, um, you know, the frog of the week. So at least there's always something for you to smile about at the end of the show. Um, so, you know, this is this show's not going to stop. Uh, the name might change in the future. I have no idea. But until then, it is the Sunday stream because... This is the only show on Sunday people should be watching. With that being said, let me go uh, share my screen now, and we can get started with today's uh, presentation. So there we go. And then we'll present.
All righty. Can't wait for Frog of the Week. Well, it's at the end of every show on Sunday, so don't you worry. They're forged in ashes, and it'll be there waiting for you. So today, I decided that we would revisit one of um, my favorite books. And I, and I say favorite because it's a really good piece of analysis. It's a little autobiographical, but it's also this really interesting piece of history, um, in part because you have a author who was incredibly entrenched in sort of the foreign policy establishment in terms of like the governing ideology of how things operate, how we take a look at like American foreign policy. But at the same time, he's incredibly nuanced in its understanding of like where that comes from and sort of the historiography of it all. Um, so uh, we'll be looking at the book Flashpoints, The Emerging Crisis in Europe. And this was published at the beginning of 2015. So this was before the re uh, Brexit referendum. And I think that's important as we talk about um, sort of his main thesis of the book. Um, so that being said, let's uh, get started. So I want to start with a little bit of background about the author. So we're going to talk about this is George Friedman. He was born in 1949. He's still uh, up and active and alive. He is the son of uh, Hungarian political refugees. Um, his parents were uh, Jewish social democrats that were living in Hungary and not only managed to avoid German occupation and you know managed to successfully evade uh, the Gestapo, um, although other members of his family were uh, taken to camps, he managed to survive. But afterwards, despite the war being over, um, he then had the problem of the Soviet Union, uh, to which George will tell you, quite frankly, that, you know, they escaped. And, you know, his father has this problem about where he wants to go when dealing with evading the Soviets, because despite the fact that they're Jewish and they had no desire to live in Israel, in part due to ideological concerns that their Arab neighbors would want them dead and he didn't want to go to war and uh, or go to the United States. So obviously, as we can tell through his uh, background here, they ended up going to the U.S. Studied political science at City College in New York, got his PhD at Cornell University, and he is best well known for being the founder of Stratfor, uh, also known as Strategic Forecasting, but he's now the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures, which is sort of the successor to what Stratfor was, which is taking a look at political analysis, geography, history, economics, and trying to make predictions based upon what countries would do based on history, as well as what their perceived national interests would be. Um, Friedman is kind of, a, in, at least in my understanding, he's a bit of a realist, but he's also in, sort of in that entrenched foreign policy establishment where I interventionism is not something that he has no problem advocating for, or at least is inclined to believe that it will happen. Now, this doesn't mean that he's right all the time, right? Because one of his earliest books is called The Coming War with Japan in 1991. He wrote that with his wife and um, I believe John S. Baker Jr. from the Federalist Society. Um, and of course, you know, if, if you know your history, you know, of course, at the time in the 70s, 80s and 90s, that Japan is a rising economic power um, to which many had feared that conflict with Japan might happen, which thankfully never did. Um, but he's also written The Next 100 Years in 2009, uh, The Intelligence Edge, How to Profit in the Information Age in 1997. Um, and these books are talking about the importance of, you know, instantaneous communication, the importance of how you, one, can take advantage of how information will be utilized in the future. And of course, this was in 1997 when the internet was just being a thing. Um, but The Next 100 Years, which was the book that got me in love with um, foreign policy, international relations, and geopolitics, is the book that tries to more or less predict what, of course, the next century is going to look like from 2009 onward. And it, there's some interesting things in there that I think he's sort of, he's, you know, we're only in the 2020s, but he's sort of kind of on the ball with, I, I know the increased importance of Turkish, um, you know, political influence, both in Europe and NATO, uh, he's predicted rather accurately. Um, he does not have, at the time, of course, right, this is right before the Arab Spring, he is not optimistic about democratic efforts in the Middle East. Um, he does think Poland is going to be some sort of power in Eastern Europe in the future, which may lead to conflict. Um, but then he's got some rather interesting um, predictions like, you know, military, um, you know, satellites and space stations in the whole rods of God thing. So it's a good read. Um, some of it doesn't seem far fetched the more I look back on it because I, I have an old weathered copy myself. I, I revisit it from time to time just to see how his predictions have held up. But this is the author that we're working with. He's a very entrenched foreign policy guy. He is a um, incredibly well-versed sort of in the intelligentsia kind of deal. Um, the Wall Street Journal calls him sort of a, a soothsayer or an oracle. 
I don't think he's right most of the time, but his he's rather prescient, and I think that he's worth exploring. Not to mention he was the guy that inspired me, and here we are now doing the stream. So that being said, um, let's get into uh, the book itself. So um, if you've ever listened to George Freeman talk about Europe, especially within the last five or six years, um, his main thesis is that the European Union is not long for this earth and that it will not uh, last as sort of this mechanism of maintaining sort of a continental peace. Um, his arguments are mainly that Europe has never been fully conquered. He, if you he listen to him talk, and even in the book, he'll tell you that, you know, the Romans tried, the Holy Roman Empire tried, Napoleon tried, Hitler tried, the Soviet Union tried, and none of them managed to successfully conquer the entire continent of Europe. Um, a lot of them came close, but none of them managed to fully, you know, unify the European continent in a way in which there is a unified order or that the political and cultural and economic differences of the various European states um, can be pushed aside for greater economic and political union. Um, and because of that, he believes that the European Union, despite its best efforts, um, it will not survive, and not even because of things like Euroscepticism, which we'll talk about later in today's presentation. Um, but he says towards the end of the 2000s, which um, we'll talk about later in this presentation, uh, are two major events at the end of the 2000s sort of disrupt the European experiment that he calls it. The financial crisis of 2008, um, which led to the Eurozone to not necessarily react to it as effectively as the United States had, causing significant political strain, and the Russian invasion of Georgia. Uh, these two crises have sparked what he calls the other flashpoints, which brings um, the historical calamity of Europe back to the brink. And the map I have on the right here uh, for you all is sort of just a uh, an explanation of the borders from World War II to where we see now um, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, and he calls this the calamity of Europe, um, 31 years of hell from 1914 to 1945. Um, and he says that despite the best efforts to recover from these conflicts, um, their scars run incredibly deep, and it is a significant impact on how the European Union holds itself together, which in turn, these old rivalries, these old flashpoints, as he calls them, will inevitably bring the European Union to its knees. He does not think that it will last long, although it is a grand and noble experiment. Um, so yeah, this is where we're at. So, um, the book begins sort of talking about two areas um, in which he wishes to provide some historical context for before bringing on the flashpoints themselves. Um, the first major part of the chapter is sort of this idea of European exceptionalism, and then, of course, uh, the causes of these flashpoints and conflict. Um, George will tell you in the book, as well as in speeches when he's talking about the book itself, is that Europe built the world. Um, the modernization from 1492 to uh, 1992 at the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, have seen the world be exactly how it is because of Europe. Um, there are some consequences, of course, worth examining, you know, the impact of colonialism, the, uh, Colum you know, the, the great exchange, the Columbian exchange. Um, but the world is the world as we know it because of the last 500 years. Um, you know, prior to European colonial efforts, you know, the Zulus never heard of the Japanese. Um, the Mayans never heard of the Chinese. And the English, you know, were never have been something known by anyone who lived in, say, the Caribbean. Um, and so the world becomes incredibly smaller and the world becomes vastly interconnected in these last 500 years of, you know, early modern history and what we call now. Um, and in part because of that, you have the enlightenment, which is sort of this driving factor of what we see in this modern narrative of history. Friedman will tell you that the enlightenment is both a blessing and a curse. And it is very interesting by many. And there's actually someone in the journal of comparative politics who I thought was really funny to quote. Uh, she said, I would never have assumed the Enlightenment is a bad thing. And I always chuckle at that review because it's just like, well, that tells you the state of uh, Western education, but also for the fact that, yes, every political concept, theory, ideology, they all do have their ups and downs. Nothing is a, a net good in the world, or I think there's always some sort of but or negative. Um, but Friedman talks about this idea of European exceptionalism, mainly through the Enlightenment, is that the curse is that it has this radicalizing aspect of individualism. The Enlightenment brings upon a hyper-individualistic attitude. It sort of starts necking and, and eating at the idea of community, um, of the nation, of the collective, which in turn makes 
more radical ideologies like we see out of the Jacobins or, um, you know, the mid-century Germans to be more prominent and profligate, uh, which in turn creates the likelihood of conflict. So uh, while Friedman himself, you know, being this sort of traditional, you know, I went to a Western university, I talked about things like the Frankfurt School and its politics, um, he does have a critical eye of the Enlightenment, although he seems to blame more of the individual um, being more likely to proselytize these extremist views, which in turn cause conflict. But at the same time, um, and it's important for this book that while older rivalries and older parts of European history will be uh, established and will be discussed, George is also referring to the more modern history of Europe, um, the destruction of the first half of the 20th century, in part because his family, you know, lived through it. He was smuggled out as a baby. After all, he was born in 1949. He was like six months old when they left Hungary. Um, and the 31 years of hell. So 1914 to 1945, uh, and the shaping of the world order as we know it, this European instability caused by these, you know, ideologies and these old rivalries are primarily the cause of how we see Europe rebuilding itself and, you know, the issues that we see today. Um, and these causes of conflict are worth examining as these bubbles are once again to arise, especially after 2008, um, and geography will play once again a major role. And the book sort of tries to justify, you know, the, the reason we study geopolitics, the geo in it, we study geography. It's important to understand the placement of nations, the peoples and states, um, and it's vital because the placement of a nation will oftentimes determine its national interests, uh, so if you're a landlocked country, right, you're not going to have a naval power, you're not a sea hegemony, whereas, you know, access to rivers, lakes, oceans, etc., all of it plays a role. Um, and so George does a, a lengthy bit of work, um, in part because of the, you know, concept of which, you know, he builds his entire career on, which is, of course, going to be geopolitics. Um, so this is the starting of the book. Um and he talks about his family in there, uh, you know, and how that shaped his perspective and most importantly shaped the perspective of many people who came to the United States at the end of the Second World War. Um, and that, you know, despite the Soviet Union's attempts for, you know, conquering Europe, you didn't have a European power in itself. You know, it had to be rebuilt. You had the Marshall Plan. Uh, you had the United States at the same time weakening a European power itself through decolonialization efforts. Um, not necessarily backing European powers when it came to um, trying to maintain its colonial powers. There's a lot of, um, he references things like Algeria, Indochina, you know, not siding with the British when it comes to certain issues. Um, so it, it tells you the fact that, you know, Europe once again is for this world order period, you know, up until say 2008, is not yet in a position to re-enter its historical trend of, various nation states all necking at each other for power and engaging in power politics as we traditionally know it, because for the last 70 years, it's been primarily, you know, the Cold War and the United States pushing its influence abroad in the European, you know, theater, so to speak. However, things begin to change. And he says that there are two big events, the Russian invasion of Georgia and the financial crisis of 2008. And the reason why he talks about how the financial crisis, of course, sh you know, begins to shake the European Union experiment is that the European system compared to the U.S. The U.S. has got one Federal Reserve, one Treasury Secretary, and, you know, its Board of Governors go. Whereas the European Union's got the European Central Bank and then 20-something-odd finance ministers all trying to pursue a national interest for a monetary and fiscal policy for their respective countries. Um, and so the push and pull of these national economies have a variety of problems that create tension. Uh, Germany, of course, has to export, you know, at the time, you know, 50% of its economy at the time uh, when this book was written was talking about how uh, Germany relies on exports and others have to, you know, take it in. And the economic interests are reigniting old national rivalries between various nation states. Um, so, I mean, any, if you understand the history of sort of the Euro crisis and sort of the divisions of what come out of it, we know that Germany sort of becomes the key player in sort of determining what the European Union policy is going to be. But at the same time, we have a coalition of say smaller states that are affected much, you know, they're hit harder by the crisis. Um, whether that's Spain, Portugal, and Italy, you know, sort of these coalitions of lesser or harder affected states, but have lesser political power, 
um, which of course in turn create you know strain on the European Union system. Uh, the second one he mentions, of course, is the Russian invasion of Georgia. Uh, George says in the book as well as in the speeches that in part this is to show Europe and the world that uh, an American promise is worth nothing. That you know, despite American you know promises at the end of the Cold War about you know promoting democracy, about promoting the f- sovereignty and freedom of these you know newly created nation states, um, that you know the United States is you know ability to defend and back those promises. Even now, we can say with hindsight with Ukraine, um, it's worth nothing. But it's also a response to American encroachment of the last two decades. We have to understand that at the end of the Cold War. You know, numerous promises were made to the Soviets, um, both to Gorbachev and successors, that the United States would not, you know, move NATO further, you know, closer towards Russian territory, towards what has been, you know, the iridescent territorial claims of the Russian state. And that, you know, the big concession that we got was that, okay, we'll unify Germany um, and maybe let them join NATO, and then that'll be it. Um, and of course, that did not happen. We, the Americans, reneged on their promises. Um, of course, through the NATO and European Union project, right? The the Maastricht Treaty, all these things, the Schengen Agreement area, all those things move further and further and further eastward, closer and closer towards Russia. And of course, in the 2004, 2005 time frame, and I think 2006 as well, you had color revolutions uh, attempted in Ukraine and other territorial, you know, areas near the Russian borders. Um, so there's a, a lot of pressure to get pro-Western movements, pro-American ideology and governments installed in these regions. And of course, you know, Russia has to respond. Um, the United States, of course, does nothing really in response to Georgia. Um, if we recall, George W. Bush is a little busy at the time. He's at the end of his term. You have a financial crisis going up. You have an incredibly unpopular war in the Middle East. Um, and you have a guy who is running for president at the time that is promising to bring people home and to close Gitmo. Um, So the idea of dragging the United States into a conflict with Georgia was just not something that was politically viable for the Bush administration at the time. Um, But Friedman argues, right, that this means, despite the dissolution of the Soviet Union um, and what has happened since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia was once again back in the game of power politics and was back in the game of the European theater. It was now in a position to project power, and it was now showing to the rest of the world that... um, walking all over sort of the husk of the Soviet Union was not going to happen anymore. And this would show that the concern of both the Russian question and what to do about the, you know, Cold War boundaries between, say, NATO and Russia um, were once again an actual serious geopolitical concern for both the United States and the European continent, especially Western Europe. Um, And those are the two things that Friedman argues are going to be the biggest issues in regards to um, showing the fractures and the cracks in the European project. Um, Let me go look at chat now here. Uh, Daniel Chang asks, what do you think about droughts and the threats of them? Also, can you provide a solution? Um, Droughts, I'm not an an irrigation or an agricultural expert. Um, Droughts are going to be a significant strategic and security issue, I think, in the future, especially as um, water becomes a more and more scarce resource, especially as desalinization technology, at least for right now, stays the same. Um, However, I do think that the likelihood of water conflict, both, you know, economically as a a commodity, but also actual access to it will be a problem. Um, Daniel, I did a whole stream a couple weeks ago on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, where we sort of talked about water politics and what's called uh, hydro hegemony. If you're interested in that sort of stuff, you can look there. As for solutions, I, it, it, at this point, I think you would require multilateral diplomatic um, sort of discussions and negotiations and treaty. But if not, m- conflict is pretty likely. Um, but moving on, uh, these are the two big events that um, Friedman argues begins to show the cracks in the European project and demonstrates that the old historical flashpoints the old fault lines of European conflict that we've seen throughout history are beginning to bubble up to the surface. And um, we go into that. So um, Friedman argues that these two events in their own separate ways brought other flashpoints to our attention as uh, both, you know, people who study geopolitics and national security. Um, This section of the book sort of covers um, 
areas in which we see fault lines since post dissolution of the Soviet Union. So post-1992 to 2009, when he write, or 2015, when he writes the book, he's sort of saying, okay, from 1992 to now, here are the issues that we're beginning to see bubble up despite the best attempts to keep Europe more or less unified under the banner of the European Union. Um, and because Europe has never been a singular entity, you always have different cultures, different peoples, um, their own intercultural and ethnic conflicts. Um, these political interests are going to bubble up to the surface now that we're sort of seeing the um, you know, resuming of these old political fault lines. So there are several fault lines or flashpoints that Friedman addresses in the book. Um, and there are four that I kind of want to cover out of the six that he talks about. Um, the German question, how a unified Germany disrupts the balance of power, which I mean, anyone who understands sort of the long span, the long arc of European history, you know that a unified Germany is a relatively new modern concept since Bismarck, so the end of the 1800s, and its impact on European politics. Um, because prior to that, uh, what we call Germany, of course, was just this, you know, tiny confederation of German states or was ruled by other empires. Uh, secondly, you have Russia and its borderlands, the iridescent territorial claims and buffer states. So the longstanding, you know, idea that Russia can play the geography game of having other territory and having, you know, sort of an ethnic claim to it and how that plays a role in the greater pro-Western expansion of, say, NATO and the European Union. Um, the second one, of course, the, the consequence of the German question, the Franco-German rivalry, an old rivalry once more for control, both of the European Union, but as well as to be a powerhouse of European politics. And then uh, fourth, which I think is the most interesting one to talk about, because we sort of saw parts of that unfold in 2016, um, Euroskeptics, the Maastricht Treaty, and the impact of the financial crisis, and what he believes is the financial crisis helped reignite um, what he believes to be a Eurosceptic or, you know, anti-European Union movement throughout Europe, which um, he believes will significantly destabilize the European project. So those are the four major ones that I want to talk about. The other two that he sort of talks about is England, which um, sort of refers back to, to the idea of, you know, England not wanting to be a part of the continent. It's the Isle, um, which he relates a lot to in terms of um, the Eurosceptics. And then the second one that I didn't bring up, but we'll, it'll get mentioned later a bit, we'll touch on it, is uh, Turkey. Um, the importance of Turkish political influence and power, whether or not that'll play a role in regards to Russia, as well as the growing influence of political Islam, both within Turkey and in Europe. Because this is, again, before Erdogan consolidates power. This is before the might, well, I mean, it's during the height of the migrant crisis, so that also plays a role as well. So, um, again, this book came out in 2015, so there's a lot that we can sort of look back on now in the last six years of what's happened, especially in the wake of, um, you know, the, the pandemic about what this analysis holds, what we can take from it, um, and what's, you know, happened. So a lot of the flashpoints that Freeman brings up, I think, are definitely hold true to this day. If you've read the book before, then you definitely know what I'm talking about, but if not, I'll try my best to break it down. Um... So Germany remains the key power player of the continent. Um, when we talk about the German question, the biggest concern I think that a lot of people had, especially if you understand the dissolution of the Soviet Union, was a lot of people, not just um, the Russians or the, the Americans, but the French and the English were incredibly concerned about a unified Germany once again playing a role in European power politics and the economic affairs. And why wouldn't they? I mean, a unified Germany brought world war, at least in the eyes of the establishment of the time, had been, you know, central to the two bloodiest conflicts in modern history and had killed, you know, millions of people. Um, you know, over 100 million people died in that 31 years of hell, not to mention the millions more that would die due to, you know, planned famines, genocide, ethnic cleansings, and so on. So there was a great concern about the Germans being once again unified and playing a role, you know, geographically and strategically within the European continent, especially in political affairs. Um, what we have seen since 2015 and what we've seen since 2008 is that Germany remains the arbiter of the economic crisis, especially with inside the Eurozone. Um, while the European Central Bank plays a major role, um, we do know that the German government and the you know, German recovery is typically what gets looked at by mainstream economists and political scientists 
in regards to the health of the European economy. So again, greater concerns over the German question uh, remains that there's a bit of resentment, especially among smaller European states. We can tell that from Greece and from Italy, um, and as well as parts of Spain and Portugal, um, that there is resentment to the Germans, especially in response to how they've managed to control it. Um, if you know me, then you know that I'm a fan of Peter Hitchens' famous lecture from a few years back, that the European Union is organized Germanism by other means. Um, and again, Germany remains a key power player on the continent, even to this day, right, where we see... Um, uh, concerns of the United, uh, or concerns, excuse me, of German influence now in regards to, you know, European politics and NATO, the German Greens, as well as the CDU are both playing major roles in the German elections and upcoming in September, which will play a role for say how Germany sways towards its relationship with Russia or the United States. Um, Michael asks, does Friedman discuss non-European threat issues like Iran or China? Yeah, he does a lot of that with his work in geopolitical features and Stratfor. Um, he also talks a lot about his most recent book about um, the 2020s and uh, the next 100 years. He does play a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on the role that Russia, China, and Japan will play. But he also believes that countries like Poland and Turkey will also play a major role on the world stage in the coming years. Um, yeah, but it would have uh, but it would have left France a clear leader on the continent for the foreseeable future. So the Anglos refused, and we got World War II instead, pretty much. Um, and how will that influence EU policy? Yeah, I mean, he, Friedman talks a lot about this from an American perspective. You'll kind of notice there's that sort of odd neoconservatism about him, about, you know, interventionism, the American century, that kind of talk. It feels very Marco Rubio-ish, um, which again, he's a, a very entrenched foreign policy official and his work has been cited a lot by the State Department and the intelligence community, which is why, again, he's not right on everything, but I think his uh, work is worth looking at. Um, but with that being said, right, the other thing that we talk about in the uh, flashpoints is that Russia's resurgence has only been bolstered. Um, we've noticed this throughout several aspects of the Ameri um, of Russia's foreign policy. Uh, we know that you know energy policy has become a major role since 2015 when this book was played. Um, whether that's the Nord Stream pipelines being finished, both NS1 and NS2 is roughly 99% complete. And the recent um, drawdown of American sanctions on the pipeline means that it will probably go forward and be collected. And keep in mind that the European Union gets 40% of its natural gas from Russia from these pipelines. Uh, and it oversteps the Balkan and the Baltic states and the Balkans um, in order to prevent issues like it saw in Ukraine a few years back. Um, in order to prevent, um, you know, a shutdown of pipelines uh, over transit fees. Uh, so it has more influence over the energy policy of Western Europe, and it has the ability to control, you know, where that natural gas and uh, energy flows, because it's no longer being dependent upon, you know, over-the-ground pipelines in which other countries can, you know, extract revenues from. Um, and of course, then you have the issues of Ukraine and Belarus, if we thought that the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008 was to show how, how much an American promise is worth, then we definitely saw the absolute, you know, igniting of the rice paper that is the American promise when it came to Ukraine. Now, we do know that the Ukraine ousting of President Viktor Yukonovich had significant American influence. Um, when you have the head of the CIA and then Senator John McCain fly to Ukraine directly into Kiev to, you know, help ascertain policy and um, agreements about arms and uh, resources. Um, there's a significant role that the United States and the West played, um, especially in regards to, you know, energy deals and trying to get a more pro-EU faction into the uh, Ukrainian government. Of course, we kind of know what happens there. The Crimean Peninsula gets annexed by the Russians, um, which, I mean, historically has been Russian anyway. I mean, you know, the Kievan Rus, uh, white Russians. There's a long ethnic and geographic history of Ukraine really being Russian. The significant population of, you know, eastern Ukraine is ethnically Russian and speak Russian. Um, and, of course, the now what we're seeing now is sort of Lukashenko and Belarus. They're both Russia and the European Union are vying over who gets to control that government um, it is indicative that Russia is moving back towards the world stage and is becoming a global power in a way that um, is interesting. It's sort of a global power in the same way that the United States is a global power, that you're seeing countries um, rather visibly in decline, both in terms of their economies and birth rates, as well as some cultural issues. Um, but at the same time, they're wrangling for power. 
Um, and of course, you know, political opposition is defeated. So Russia's resurgence, of course, right, is only going to stay because the West, through its clandestine and overt efforts politically, have not managed to oust, you know, um, Vladimir Putin or those in his inner circle. I mean, they can sanction them, but I mean, as we can see with their recent attempts with Alexei Alvani, that opposition from the West and people trying to come in from the West in order to seize the Russian government and its power has not happened. Um, Russia's resurgence has definitely stayed on, and I think that we will see for the foreseeable future uh, Russia to be a significant power in the area. Um, but of course, the other issue that we sort of touch base on in the book that Friedman recognizes will also be a threat, and he sort of takes a Huntingtonian analysis from this, is that you have that cultural class of civilization. So you have the rising resurgence of political Islam, um, both within the Middle East from the Arab Spring, um, the you know reaction to Western attempts at democratizing the Middle East and extension uh, migrant populations is the rise of political Islam. You know, in Egypt, before it was shut down by the United States and others, um, you had the Muslim Brotherhood, which still is a significant political faction um, within Egypt and other regions. Um, but there's political Islam, right? Like Hunt, Sam, uh, Samuel P. Huntington talks about this in The Clash of Civilizations. Is that It's not that they're trying to, you know, modernize Islam. They're trying to Islamify modernity. And we're seeing that now in the coale you know, coalescence of political power and political Islam. Um, Erdogan's a really great example in Turkey, and he talks about this. Um, but we're also seeing this clash of what it means to be European, um, in part because of demographic change and the migrant crisis, which the Europeans of course, through their governments, not necessarily by the popular sovereignty, has, you know, brought in millions of people that have no cultural or political identity to that of Europe. And in turn, that will significantly strain as countries try to assimilate and integrate these populations, and in turn will cause the European Union to be further fractured, because it'll be very hard to have an organization that promotes human rights, democracy, these sort of high liberal ideals, when significant portions of your population do not believe in them or are against them or find them to be an affront to their religion. And I mean, we're seeing that now, especially in education. Um, we see this with, you know, the issues of gay rights, where you see sort of the strange political realignment where numerous right-wing parties or Eurosceptic or anti-immigration parties in Europe are courting, um, you know, the gay community, uh, you know, saying that we're sort of your only bulwark against political Islam, so vote for the right-wingers, or at least vote for the anti-immigrant guys, and that will take further strain on the uh, European project. Uh, so, okay, let's see here. Yeah, just today the AFD took a major L. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen uh, Shrouded Hills with the AFD just took today, but um, let's take, uh, but again, I'll, I'll br bring into it. So uh, in the book, Friedman, right, he talks about the importance of how Euroscepticism is triggered primarily through the financial crisis. I mean, it, it had been there before. We know that UKIP had been around since the 90s, but um, mainstream, it sort of takes off due to the financial crisis and the Euro crisis that takes forward. Um, the Euroskeptics start to, you know, see as a political reaction to what took place in 2008. Um, however, as we've seen both from, you know, the pandemic as well as sort of the political powers that be, um, uh, European populism, right, did not have as much of the impact as it say it did in the Anglosphere in the United States or England. Um, you know, parties like the AFD have been the target of the security state. They have been under surveillance from the German, you know, intelligence community for a while now. Um, and they have not been as politically successful as one would thought. But I mean, of course, I'm not surprised for a right-wing party to not do well in Germany. Um, and then, of course, we have Brexit. This book was written in 2015, so this was before the referendum. And we have now been able to tell since, you know, the 2016 referendum vote to now what a political fiasco it has been from the, the government, the Tory government, as well as those in um, Remain that have, you know, worked with the European Union to not make Brexit happen, or at least to water it down to a degree that the referendum wouldn't matter. Um, when you had Guy Verhofstadt literally campaigning with the Lib Dems in, uh, I think, the 2019 election, 
um, and is indicative to us that the European Union did everything it could, along with sort of the establishment government of the UK, and along with its civil service, to make it such a fiasco that the idea of leaving the European Union would be such a distasteful notion in other, you know, po political parties and entities in other European countries that they would never attempt it. Um, I think the closest that we've seen about, you know, sort of the Eurosceptic movement get close was um, Emmanuel Macron's election because, you know, Marine Le Pen was the, made it to the second round of voting. But it, it is indicative now that the Brexit fiasco, and I, it is a fiasco because this should have been a quick and easy aspect. Um, and uh, that's where we're at, is that there should nothing have happened. Um, it shouldn't have happened. And I mean, even David Cameron didn't want it to happen despite pushing forward, um, you know, for the referendum, hoping that he would get what he want. But that's where we're at. And so because of this Brexit fiasco, we can tell that Friedman's faith in Euroscepticism, or at least his uh, predictions of Euroscepticism, was not as strong as he had originally planned. Um, and I mean, of course, this is to me, anyone, right, who's in our sort of sphere of politics is like, well, this is sort of a confirmation that uh, the elite, you know, our, our government in power have no desire to really follow the will of the people. And on top of that, they tried so hard to manufacture the consent for what the popular will should be or what the general welfare should be. Um, that, you know, Brexit to me is a really reaffirming cr criticism of democracy is that you can have the purest form of democracy, a national referendum, and the government in charge will not follow through on the orders of its people. Um, clearly a, um, a, a spit in the eye to what the idea of uh, liberalism is. But in part because of that, um, you know, Friedman's idea that the European project is going to be threatened by Euroscepticism, we can tell in the last six years since this book was written, that despite populism's efforts, um, in Western Europe it has not succeeded. In Eastern Europe we have seen to a degree, primarily as a reaction to the migrant crisis, uh, a more anti-European Union stake in things. However, I do not think that uh, countries like Austria or Hungary or Poland at the current point in time, have the political or military power to necessarily resist, um, say, France or the, um, the Germans. Um, but of course, the other thing that we can take a look back on is uh, Turkey and its potential slide into political Islam. Now, we saw this through Erdogan's consolidation of power. Of course, this is in part a response to the American efforts to oust Erdogan to get a more pro-Western and pro-NATO um faction into the uh, Turkish government. But again, political Islam remains potent both in Turkey as well as the migrant populations that are not as liberal, that are not as democratic. And of course, you know, with the rising trends in demography inside Western and Eastern Europe, it will play a significant role in, in the coming years ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, of all these things here, Friedman gets a lot right, but Friedman also gets a lot wrong. But I think what Friedman got wrong, right, also has a lot to play with the role of, you know, the pandemic. Um, this was not something that anyone, I think, would rationally be able to foresee uh, or foresaw. You know, I didn't see a pandemic, you know, disrupting the entire year of 2020. And I don't think any other analysts did as well, um, unless you were literally um, ahead of the game. There are very few people that were studying, for, you know, this sort of stuff in, a, in an analyst kind of way. But still, um, and so I think the coronavirus pandemic has a lot of a huge impact on the government's response to dissidents. Um, it managed to successfully globally, right, with the, with the exception of, you know, mainly a lot of us on the right, um, you know, manages to condition the population for lockdowns, masks, seizes an ungodly amount of power, more power than I think any sort of monarchy ever had during these kind of times of disease, and manages to successfully curtail political opposition um, even those that managed to speak out, right, it's very milk toast, and those that rallied against it were, you know, labeled as murderers, anti-science, morons, despite the fact that they're probably more scientifically literate than those who say, you know, I fucking love science. Um, which, of course, I think plays a role in how Euroscepticism definitely takes a hit. I do share academic agents' um, analysis that a lot of the response to what currently happened with the pandemic did almost everything it could to curtail populism and curtail its, you know, position of power um, and make sure that it wasn't being challenged by the traditional democratic means, whether that's through fortification, 
or, you know, delaying elections or, you know, um, using lockdowns to prevent political rallies and preventing political associations from happening. Um, if there was no illusion of democracy, we could at least have real peasants revolt instead of the cluster that we have. Yes, and I think that you're seeing more and more people become disillusioned with our current state of affairs, which is which is a white pill, um, especially when you have people talking about wanting political leaders that will just use state power to start fighting back against this corruption. So there, there is hope. Um, uh, Tuesday, FA says, who said Angela Merkel was leaving office? I tend to think that they're stuck with her nasty style for eternity. Uh, well, she is stepping down. Um, there will be an election in September which when we get closer to it, I will probably do a whole rank pundit tree Sunday stream on the German elections because right now it's sort of between the CDU successor and the German greens. Uh, and the greens have sort of been used as a front by the Americans to push sort of their anti Nord stream Two policies. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out in the future, but no uh, Angela Merkel old Muti is finally um, stepping down. All right, so moving on. So taking a look at what Friedman got wrong and what Friedman got right, um, we can sort of take a look at the last six years and sort of look towards the future of Europe. And I think it's important that for anyone who lives in the European continent or lives in the United States, um, that a lot of the world order is shaped by the politics of the European continent. And failure to not recognize historical differences, um, the rivalry between you know various states, um, tells us that the uh, the future is very uncertain for Europe, uh, especially as administrations in the United States can change. Um, as we can tell, we went from a rather um, inward-looking administration um, to which the powers that be did not like that, so we installed a different president that is traditionally back to normal, quote-unquote, um, and more pro-Europe, pro-NATO. But we're at this weird time for choosing because... Um, you're, you have a foreign policy establishment in the European system um, and European countries that are, you know, have to choose between sort of this existing world order of NATO, the United States, and this multipolar balance of power that is really most likely going to be the reality of the future ahead, especially as the United States continues to decline in its ability to exert influence abroad. Um, so the real choice, of course, is the United States, the NATO, EU, sort of George H.W. Bush, New World Order style of leadership versus multipolar states. And this, of course, has to, a lot to do with the reaction to the Trump administration uh, between forcing or trying to pressure NATO countries to pay their fair share or to, you know, increase it from 2% to 2.5% of national GDP to be spent on defense. Um, and, of course, the concerns um, that others, such as the infamous guy, Dieter Hofstadt, and uh, other European Union leaders have suggested of having a singular banner European army under the flag of the European Union. But, of course, uh, in part because of this, the Eastern-Western European divides will become more prominent, both internally and externally. Um, we're seeing this primarily on grounds of American power and immigration. Um, so you're seeing a lot more of a pro-American side from, say, the Austrians, the Hungarians, mainly the Polish um, and the Baltic states. And then, of course, you know, you have Western Europe, which is primarily ability to project power on its own. The French, the English, the Germans, of course, um, who are far more open, neoliberal, open to immigration, more skeptical of American power because they believe that if, you know, someone like Trump can get into office, which is questionable now, um, why would we want to be reliant upon the European, er, the Americans, especially when the American world order is also providing a significant strain on the European project, whether that's, you know, grounds of American social issues that we see from sort of what a lot of people call like the globalist American empire, um, or woke capital, which is sort of America's cultural export now, which is the left, um, causing significant strain politically here, where you even see France now rejecting sort of critical race theory, a lot of American academic institutions and traditions um, saying that, you know, it's anti-France, it's disruptive to the national identity and to the country, so we have to do something about it. So you're seeing this skepticism towards the traditional standing of American power. Um, and in part because of that, we're now going to see a lot of the European rivalry um, re-emerge that Friedman talked about in the book, in part because, well, if they don't have the Americans to rely on or if they can't necessarily trust the American government and its foreign policy establishment or even its cultural exports, 
than it has to be reliant upon itself, and it more or less becomes a far more anarchic world than it was, say, 20 years ago. And again, if you are someone in the realist school of thought, then you will recognize that the world is inherently anarchic when there isn't necessarily a dominant um, unipolar state mandating or controlling international institutions. And we know definitely through, say, the United Nations and the WHO, that, that isn't the case. So we're going to see Europe get a lot more chaotic in its internal politics in the coming years ahead, especially on the grounds of culture, uh, immigration, and yeah. Uh, your Western Europe, Eastern Europe categorization, since you still live in the 80s, there's something called Central Europe, and also if you're Hofstra, he's the least stable person I've ever seen. Yeah, he is the least stable person, Raphael. Uh, Raphael. I, I agree that he's unstable, but unfortunately he's... And while he's not in power anymore, the fact that the idea of the European military project is something that's been advocated by both the German and the French government is something that we'll see in the future. Um, and unfortunately, because the American government still plays a role in policy, the Eastern-Western divide is still very much in the 1980s, um, in part because the Americans want to look at things like it's the 1980s. It still is a terrible idea. There's still very much a Central Europe, and I think that we can get into that in a minute, so don't worry. I'm well aware of how this sounds. I'm just simply telling you that this is how the Americans are looking at things, um, especially traditional foreign policy establishment viewing. Um, and if you've read the book, then you'll definitely see that Friedman himself looks at things like it's still very much the 1980s and how things have transcended since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1992. Um, Alexander Dugan thinks that the EU is a global liberalism, but on a smaller scale, that it will actually spread to other regions. Uh, to an extent, I mean, in Foundations of Geopolitics, his 1995 work, he talks about how the European project is definitely um, a form of American global liberalism on a smaller scale. Uh, however, he also is, sort of talks about in that book the ways that it can be dismantled. Um, but I, I would have to read more of his work. The Kremlin stopped listening to Dugan and so should you. <laughs> um, yeah, but he's still, I don't know why he's still ridiculously popular, but we'll get into that. Um, sometimes when you talk, you sound a lot like Louis. I assume you mean Louis Laval, which if so, that's a win in my book because he's great. But um, continuing on with the presentation, I need to stop looking at chat. I'll get to it in a minute. Um, the other issue, of course, is that Euroskepticism um, remains to be seen as a political force in response to the pandemic. I mean, the European Union, at least for now, is still relatively intact. However, I do think that Friedman's analysis of the Franco-German rivalry is showing its head. Um, I mean, despite the fact that Merkel is stepping down, France recognizes that Germany is becoming sort of the de facto power on the European continent, which, of course, is a concern. England has withdrawn itself sort of from the continent, at least from the European Union. Um, and of course we're seeing, you know, tensions from the, on the English channel with the French and English navies. However, the Franco German rivalry is showing its head when both of them have talked about, you know, the European army, um, putting out a stronger military position independent of NATO or the United States. Um, so we're, I think in the coming years ahead, despite the best efforts of say Macron and Merkel to maintain a positive relationship between France and Germany, I do sincerely think that in the future, um, you will see the Franco-German rivalry show its ugly head once again, um, at least in some form of political or strategic um, tensions between the two countries, as both of them try to become sort of the leader of the European project and use the European Union for its own political ends. Um, especially as both try to manage in their own ways the um, response to the migrant crisis. We know in the last few months that Macron has announced that there will be a significant increase in military spending and agreements with uh, you know North African countries on border security and curtailing uh, extremism and prepping for the French military for military engagements. So I do think that we're showing that it's political, you know, the rivalry will definitely show itself in the near future. Uh, the other thing, though, to look at, though, of course, is the EU remains intact and populism has been more or less curbed. Is you know, um, Eurosceptic parties have either been a target of the security apparatus of the various countries or have simply lost out in elections. Um, that the EU remains, you know, still relatively strong in its ability to flex its political muscle and to maintain more or less its control and sovereignty over the continent, at least in the West, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, not so much. Um, but let's take a look here. 
Uh, Turkey remains, of course, a potent source of conflict. I, I say it's the Eastern Question 2.0, in, in part because despite the fact that Turkey has a relatively tenuous relationship at best with, uh, with, the, uh, with Europe and NATO and the United States, they have been sort of getting a little closer to Russia in recent years, uh, in part through the um, purchasing of Russian anti-air missiles and equipment like the S-400 series. Um, I mean, from 2015 to now, right, we went from shooting down Russian aircraft over Syria and Turkish airspace to buying Russian military equipment and increasing a diplomatic relationship with Vladimir Putin and President Erdogan. There's still tension because um, Turkey, of course, being a NATO ally, has made positive statements towards a pro-Western Ukraine. But it still remains a political factor that the European Union and the continent will have to deal with. And as we've more recently seen with Erdogan, they sort of hold more or less the leverage on the European Union and talks about European Union integration. Because despite all of the pontificating that the European Union can have on, say, human rights and migration, uh, the European Union doesn't necessarily have any sort of leverage on, you know, Erdogan, because Erdogan holds the cards and has a significant strategic importance as it's sort of the doorstep to the Middle East. Um, it's sort of a doorstep to moderate, quote-unquote, political Islam, as well as the fact that Erdogan has access to military resources with NATO and Russia, and, of course, the biggest one, the, you know, biological factor, which is that the migrant crisis, to which, you know, Erdogan is threatened that he's got millions of refugees that he could just flood into Europe at the flip of a switch. Um, which means that, you know, migrants, political Islam, and its current state of a NATO partner makes Turkey one of the most po potent sources of both political and strategic conflict, both within, you know, Eastern Europe, but as well as within the politics of the European Union itself. So overall, looking towards the future of Europe, we're going to see that question happen of whether or not it tries to reaffirm itself to the existing world order, which is what the current administration here in the U.S. wants. Um, but of course, the Eastern Western European divides will show itself more prominently, especially on the question of American power and immigration. We're seeing things like Poland, you know, demand a stronger U.S. military presence. Um, you know, countries like Hungary and Austria are incredibly skeptical of, you know, the current EU migrant policy, which has caused significant strain, which is why you see people like Orban or Sebastian Kurz being incredibly anti-immigrant in their policy. Um, but despite that, though, there's Euroscepticism did not win out in the way that, say, populism in the United States won out in 2016. Um, unlike the Anglosphere, it was more or less contained by the European Union. Um, and that sort of shows us, I think, what we have uh, in terms of the uh, European future, and at least what we have currently right now. Uh, will Poland be ripped off of its current path as soon as the current party is voted out? It depends on how strong the Peace and Justice Party holds out in elections. If they lose out, I would I would probably see a lot of the work that the Peace and Justice Party has accomplished in the last several years to wither away quickly as Poland tries to more or less politically reintegrate into the European Union. Um, so if you are a Polish viewer or you know people in, in Poland... Um, I mean, I, I would vote for the Peace and Justice Party simply because I'm not a fan of the EU. I think the EU should be destroyed. Um, transnational, you know, organizations that violate the national sovereignty of a people I, and the, the nation state to me is a, is a disservice to civilization. Um, are young Polish people watching Netflix or not? That's your answer. Yeah, there you go. Um, the process of Turkish intrusion into the EU should have ended decades ago. Sarkozy even signified he'd end it, but of course he didn't. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think that you could have had a successful integration at all. I think that that was a lot of sort of that new early 2000s um, hubris of like markets and trade liberalization leads to democratization BS that obviously didn't work here in the United uh, that didn't work with Turkey and it didn't work with China. Um, I, to me, that's great sort of post uh, 1990s neoliberal hubris that I think uh, the West is still paying for. Um, but here we are at the end. That, that's the conclusion of my lecture. So I thought that um, we would end things, of course, with the frog of the week. And here we are. The frog of the week is the pixie bullfrog, also known as the edible bullfrog or Peter's bullfrog. They are a large bodied species primarily related to the African bullfrog. They do a short, deep whooping call at irregular intervals. It doesn't last very long, usually about half a second. Um, and it's uh, very deep. Uh, you can find them in countries such as Mali, Angola, Burkina Faso, Kenya, and Chad, just to name a few. 
Um, as the name implies, it is eaten at a local level as a delicacy, but not on a subsidence level. We don't eat them very regularly, but they are the edible bullfrog for a reason. They are uh, cooked and eaten by the people in those respective countries. It's also seen on the international pet trade, and it is not listed as an endangered species by the uh, international conventions of the bee that regulate these statistics on how a species is labeled as endangered or worried or concerned. They are labeled as one of least concern, LC. Um, so that's the frog of the week. That is our wonderful pixie bullfrog right there on the right. Certainly a good boy. They're all good boys. And uh, now that I've hit 2,000 subscribers, I will follow through on my promise from both a backer and others that have suggested in my Twitter DMs to do a frog tier list video. So if you want to uh, have a frog featured on this frog tier list video, um, you can at me on Twitter at to be prudential or DM me, or, uh, you know, you can find my YouTube email through the channel and send me the pictures of frogs and I will put together a um, video and have them all on a tier list. But this is the frog of the week. This is the pixie bull frog. And this is my lecture for all of you on George Friedman's 2015 work, uh, Flashpoints, the emerging crisis in Europe. And looking back on the last six years of his analysis and predictions, and with that being said, um, let's just hang out for a bit and take a look at Super Chats. I know that someone had sent one just a second ago, so let me go pull up YouTube Studio, and then I will try my best to answer said question. Oops. Okay, here we go. See all. Uh, Bolero three nine three for four ninety nine. Thank you so much. He asks, "Do you think the former Warsaw Pact countries that rely on European subsidies will acquiesce to Brussels and take more migrants in the coming decades?" Um. So that's sort of like the question that we have here in the United States, right? Is that um, in regards to say like coercive federalism, right? Like, will red states move on with blue state policies because you know federal unfunded mandates or federal, um, you know, return of uh, federal funding? Um, I think that, however, because you know these are different countries and not necessarily American states, that I think that if someone is ballsy enough, right, or that sees the political winds move in such an area where the anti-migrant attitude is greater than, say, the need for European Union and Brussels subsidies, I think that they'll reject um, the migrants in, in the coming decades. I think as we see the fears of, you know, French and um, English right-wingers kind of come true with demographic change and political Islam, I think that you will see a, a very strange divide almost along the Iron Curtain, not necessarily entirely, um, between NATO countries and, say, former Warsaw Pact countries, um, how they accept migrants. I do not know if the Brussels money will be enough, especially even now that we see countries like Austria, Poland, and Hungary sort of reject, um, you know, EU calls for accepting migrants. You're seeing actual border fences and walls come up and rejections of migrants. So I'm not necessarily positive on the idea that these former Warsaw Pact countries will acquiesce to Brussels. I think that you will see a rejection on cultural, ethnic, and civilizational lines. I think that Huntington's analysis of sort of the idea of civilization will play a much greater role than any sort of money that Brussels can provide can. Um, but yeah, again, Bolero, thank you very much for the $4.99. Uh, like I've said in the past, all of this money goes to my medical expenses, which I greatly appreciate, because it's uh, less money for my paycheck. I have to deal with and makes me a, a little less uh, concerned about getting back in the wage cage. Are Republican states already not enacting far left policy? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I'm watching my state turn into California in real time because Governor Greg Abbott's like, look at how great red states are. Look at how low our taxes are bringing all these techies from San Francisco over as he watches his, you know, governor's mansion disappear right before his very eyes. Uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Shrouded Hill says Eastern Europe has bad demographics, aka terrible economic outlooks, brain drain, and corruption. That will keep most migrants out. Uh, most likely, yes. Um, Nathan Judd, technically France borders Brazil. 
Oh boy. Um, yeah, and I mean, for those talking about like brain drain and such, I mean, like we're going to see the very aspect of Spandrel's IQ shredder continue to like decimate European cities, especially in the West, um, and of course here in the United States as well. So I mean, um, the more you know, active economic, you know, productive countries and states are going to see that sort of brain drain and shredding happen in real time. Whereas Eastern Europe, ironically, through its own demographics and its own poor economic outlook, might be able to survive and have its current forms of government like stay intact as they erect border walls. Um, I predict that Abbott will lose re-election next year to a Democratic opponent. I wholeheartedly hope so. I don't want him to, in part because I don't want a Democrat in office, but I swear to God, if uh, the Democrats in Texas were smart, they would have drafted Matthew McConaughey already and had him start running on a normie, like, let's all, like, unify kind of platform and just run for office because Governor Greg Abbott's chances of re-election would be just as, you know, effective as his ability to walk. It wouldn't happen. I tell that bum Clausington to make an IQ Shredders 2 video if you guys still talk. Uh, we talk on Telegram, so if you look in the description, you can find my Telegram page, and you can tell I, uh, Clausington yourself. He also has his own uh, Telegram channel called the IQ Shredders. Um, but as he said in my uh, description, uh, when we had uh, Prudent Reads on Bronze Age Mindset, that he uh, would be looking into doing a more writing because he's got the IQ shredders two video uh, script written. So, I mean, if you want to bother him, go find him on telegram. <laughs> uh, bringing in tech through a worship of my capitals, what really turns States blue. Yep. You're seeing that happen in Florida, Texas, and California, uh, North Carolina. And it's absolutely depressing. Um, but with that being said, uh, let me go uh, stop. Uh, sharing real quick here and uh as we get closer to the end I'm, i'll stay on for a little while longer but that's the presentation and let me go uh shill some other stuff so let me share screen there we go so if you're uh more interested in becoming a monthly backer i've got my subscribe star right here you can find me at the prudentialist on subscribe star as i've said before all of this money goes you know towards medical expenses um, for those of you who don't know or are new to the channel, I have a, I'm dealing with kidney failure. I'm currently on the list. I do dialysis at home and this, you know, allows me to give a little bit of extra peace of mind because all of this money that I get, whether it's from super chats, ad revenue, or the subscribe star backers, all of this just goes to paying for things like my pills or my insurance stuff. So the fact that you guys help me out with that I don't keep any of this money. It doesn't pocket into like a savings or retirement account or anything. This just gives me a little extra peace of mind knowing that there's just a little bit of extra money going towards expenses that I need to keep going. Um, so I greatly would appreciate any sort of help or backing um, because all of this goes right back towards keeping me going and all that jazz. So there's my subscribe star stuff. Um, and again, no pressure. I Like I said, this money just helps me with an extra peace of mind. Um, and I, and I don't pocket it or keep it. It literally goes to things like medical bills or my prescriptions or pills. So again, that's what I've got and that's what I do it for. Um, but all right, let's see what chat's got here. Fanami says the most out there idea from Friedman and somewhat from once his protege, Peter Zihan is that Japan will go their own way. Maybe even become a major rival to the United States. I don't see it anytime soon. I don't either, especially now that Shinzo Abe is out of office. I really do see more of that neoliberal integration from Japan. I do not see them going their own way. Um, and I think Japan would go their own way only in reaction to say an unprecedented influx of say migrants. Um, I know that the more left-leaning aspects of the Japanese parliamentarian parties have advocated for, um, you know, migrant introduction, even an unpopular idea as it is in Japan, um, to, to deal with the issues of the workplace, the demographics issues, the birth rate. Um, but unless that policy were enacted, um, I do not see Japan going their own way anytime soon. Japan, I think, is intrinsically linked to the United States, uh, both for economic reasons and security states. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I, I do think that the demographic issue probably won't play as much of a role. I do think maybe more of the cultural work-life issue. Um, but again, I think that the fact that China's right on its doorstep and that it's sort of reliant on its own self-defense force, the United States and say Australia, 
I don't think they'll be going their own way anytime soon. If the Chinese threat or concerns of China were mitigated or somehow dampened, then sure, um, they might go their own way, but I don't think so. Not anytime soon. Um, yeah, Japanese culture and the language is so alien to the rest of the world that mass migration wouldn't work for Japan, even if they got all the smart ones. I agree. Uh, Tuesday FA Tuesday says, I don't think populism ever had any actual power or influence. They gave us a 2001 Lakers style beat down this past year. Yes, they did. Um, and I, I just don't see how it will come back. I, I think you had a once in a lifetime chance in 2016 here in the United States. And then you completely screwed up the end game. Like you didn't clean house of the institutions. You didn't clean house of the civil service. You let the press and your own government eat you alive. Um, they were that, that administration was woefully unprepared. And I might do in the future some sort of video or commentary on just like what went wrong and maybe sort of as a like, hey, if you're a future political activist or a future, you know, dissident, like here are the mistakes of that administration and its four years in order to, you know, potentially be better, like sort of like a modern day, you know, princely kind of article. Um, I, I don't know. I might do something like that. But Vietnam and Japan will remain firmly in the U.S. orbit. Oh, absolutely. Um, the only one right now that sort of drifted away from the American orbit has been the Philippines. But even then, it's been very wishy-washy. But other than that, how's everyone doing? How's, how's everyone's Sunday so far? Are you all enjoying yourselves? I, I really enjoy doing these lectures and speeches. I, I am a, I, I like the fact that we can go in depth in something every week and learn something new. Uh, Nathan asks, should we form an offshoot community in another country if they are friends, Russia or India? Uh, do you mean like nationally or do you mean like just a bunch of expatriates moving to another country? Uh, do I have any thoughts on Peter Zihan in general? I, I don't. I get asked that question a lot on my thoughts on Peter Zihan. I have not read a lot of his work. I, I've i read like the Disunited States, which was sort of just a, a an internal American political analysis. But I do not read him regularly, nor have I, uh, I, I've heard a lot about him, but I don't, I don't follow him regularly or have any thoughts on him. If there's anything that you think I should read about him, by all means, just at me on Twitter and tell me and I'll give it a read, but I don't have any specific thoughts. Um, well, I'm glad that you're cozy, Forged. I, I hope that I can provide a, a, a good lecture and a good conversation. Um, Nathan says, somewhere in between. Uh, some form of protection or independence, I guess. I, I mean, if you're going to do something like that, my only recommendation would be find a, a country or a community that has a similar cultural and ethnic value, because if not, you're going to be seen as alien, foreign, and hostile, and that's only going to cause more problems for you and whatever group that you do. I think the smarter thing to do would be sort of, you know, take advantage of the current institutions and try and, you know, root out the governing ideology. That way you have the infrastructure in place to do something better. But that's my opinion. Uh, Bolero for nine ninety nine. Thank you so much. What do you think would be the next biggest geopolitical surprise in Europe for the next ten to fifteen years? Sihan is okay, but he's too geographically deterministic. Oh well, that's good to know. I mean, geographic determinism does play a huge role for geopolitical analysis. I wouldn't be surprised that he's a little bit geographically deterministic, but I mean, there are other things other than geography to look at. Um, as for the next ten to fifteen years, what would be the biggest geopolitical surprise in Europe? Um, I think the, the next, I think really the big, the biggest thing that you're going to see in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, Bolero and, and chat is going to be the um, Franco German rivalry. I think that that is going to be the biggest surprise in the next 10 to 15 years, because it really you're going to see a Germany that for the last, you know, 10 years under Angela Merkel has been more or less the leader of the European union and greater extent, the leader of the European continent. And we do not know if the successor to Merkel is going to necessarily have the, the, the strength or the political wherewithal to maintain that. Whereas we do know, regardless if Macron stays in office or someone succeeds him like Le Pen, that you're going to see the French national interest arise, uh, both in military and politics. Um, so I think that a significant um, degradation or withering of the German-French relationship will be the biggest geopolitical you know, factor in the next 10 to 15 years. I would definitely see that being one of the biggest issues there, um, especially as uh, 
uh, France tries to assert itself on the world stage more. Uh, question for the end. What do you think about India in the long term, say 2050? Um, it really depends on what India decides to do with China. So uh, the United States can try its best to bolster its relationship with India. However, India is engaged in a series of like border security agreements with the Chinese and has adopted some Chinese di diplomatic advances. Um, so by 2050, the real question is, you know, what part of sphere of influence does India decide to put, put its camp in the Chinese or say the West? Um, uh, until India, however, significantly improves things like medical and transportation infrastructure, uh, as well as manage its power problems, um, I, I do think that it will be more or less reliant upon a foreign power in the future, at least for now, at least the next 10 to 15 years. As for 2050, I do think that um, uh, factors such as, you know, population density, energy, and its uh, own, you know, ability to manufacture domestically will play a huge role. But until then, I think it will firmly have to pick a camp between, you know, the East or the West. Uh, let's take a look here. India could be very powerful, needs a strong Navy to reclaim Kashmir, may need economic centralization. Yeah, unless it, it starts to improve its ability for domestic manufacturers and either finds you know, a diplomatic or military solution to the Kashmiri issue, like, that's going to constantly be focused on immediate political border issues rather than, say, the world stage. So it, it really depends on how it can take care of its, like, backyard problems before anything else. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Gustavian says, the Danish nationalists won so hard that every other party was forced to accept their premises, and now most of the parties are competing to be based. Huh. Well, maybe I'll do a, a video on Danish politics. Who knows? I'll have to take a look at that. Um, but with that being said, I do think that the future of Europe is still relatively uncertain. I do think that to answer, referring back to Bolero's question, uh, the biggest issue, of course, is going to be the Franco-German rivalry. I think it's going to play a huge role in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but yeah, if you haven't read George Friedman's Flashpoints, I highly recommend that you get it. It's like $10 on Amazon. I highly recommend that you purchase it. Um, it's an, it's an excellent read. Um, and I think Friedman's analysis is incredibly worthwhile, um, in reading and taking a look at. Uh, but with that being said, this has been another episode of the Sunday stream. Um, I will give some channel announcements. Uh, this week I will have a, uh, another episode of Real Talk out. I kind of want to talk about the whole Matt Walsh thing and the concept of owning the libs. So um, expect a lovely video in the future. I did get some fishing done last, uh, or yesterday, actually. Um, uh, there's a, a bass on camera that y'all get to see. So that'll. I always love catching something on camera for you guys. That way you have something to enjoy when I do these real talk videos. And then, hopefully, I will have um, my uh, politics my of uh, masculinity video out soon. That's a, a long-form one I've been working on for a while, on and off now sort of just talking about, you know, the idea of positive male role models and why it's so important for us to have them in politics, especially for us on the right, as we take a look at the crazy stuff that's happening, especially in sort of the modernity, you know, left bread tube style thing, or, you know, if you're a successful bread tuber and you want to keep the money rolling in, you got to transition. Um, but yeah, I, and just to, to wrap things up, I, we've made it to 2k. I'm incredibly thankful for all of you guys. Um, and with that being said, uh, like I said earlier, we made it to 2,000 subs, so frog tier list video will happen, and all you gotta do is just at me on Twitter, or, you know, you find my YouTube email on my channel, and just send me the pictures of frogs that y'all wanna see. Um, and that's what I've got. So with that being said, I'm gonna wrap it up here, all. This has been the Sunday Stream episode number 11. We talked about flashpoints. And you all should read the book. And we've got this fantastic lecture for you all to enjoy. I love every single one of you. Thank you all so much for everything. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and be prudent, everybody. Take care.